James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. So if you have your Bible, you might want to turn there, and uh, I'll read the scripture and we'll get started. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? The issue of uh, Christianity Today this past month, the March issue, had an excellent article about identifying rather than judging against other people, those that we walk alongside with. And it used the prophet Daniel, whose own behavior was exemplary, honorable, was living for God, and how Daniel is miles apart from rebellious Israel, and yet he offers in a prayer in Daniel chapter 9, he offers a 16-verse prayer, and he identifies with these people of sin. These people who have rebelled against God, even though he is righteous in his own life. He owns the sin himself. So here are some phrases. We won't read the the prayer. It's fairly lengthy. But let me just read you some phrases from Daniel chapter 9. Daniel says, we have sinned. We have rebelled. We have not listened. We have done wrong. We have been faith, uh, we have been wicked, we have transgressed, we have turned away, we have been unfaithful, we have refused to obey, and on and on. Sixteen times we see the word we, the personal pronoun we, instead of how I would probably pray that prayer is they. They have sinned, they have gone astray. God bring judgment upon them. But that is not the way Daniel acts. He confesses as part of them. And then the article goes on to continue to give examples that are to the contrary and how we quickly judge and divide because as God-fearing people of all persuasions, the article said, we are certain that we hold the high moral ground. And that's where judgment comes from, right? We are on the higher moral ground, so therefore I have a right to be able to judge you or to slander you. And the article actually gives some examples of this. Martin Luther, for example, who condemned the Anabaptists as heretical for their rejection of infant baptism and actually called for their execution or banishment. The Puritans who went to war with the Church of England over reforms they saw as non-negotiable. He mentioned George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers who fought bitterly over the doctrine of predestination. Now, our issues today may be different, vastly different than that. But the point is, is that there will be issues which will divide and which will cause us to want to judge our brother because we feel like we're on the higher moral ground. And so what do we do with that? How do we respond when we feel that way? And we ask the same question that James asked. Who am I? Who am I to judge my neighbor? So I want us just to look at four statements about judging today and what it means and what I think James is trying to teach us this morning. And here's the first statement if you're taking notes on the sheet inside of your program. We're brothers and sisters. We're brothers and sisters, not judges. I think that's a great place for us to start because twice in this passage, just two verses long, we see brothers and sisters in verse 11, and then we see it again in the same verse, brothers and sisters. So we are brothers and sisters. We are not judges. James called us to be family, not jurors and judges. Paul says the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. He explains how Gentiles and Jews come together and they become fellow citizens. But then he goes one step more intimate and says, you are members of God's household. We're part of the same family. We are brothers and sisters. This is who we are. We are not judges. We're a spiritual home. In other words, the church is a family room and not a courtroom. 
Super important for us to understand as a church. I've shared this a long time ago, but many years ago, back in uh, my mid-20s, so like 10 years ago, um, a lot longer than that, I was in a courtroom living in Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, we had this, uh, we had leaves in our yard that were just like piled high, and I uh, got like 20, 25 package or uh, bags of leaves all bundled up. Nowhere to put them, and uh, would have taken them to the dump, except I looked down and noticed that my ring was gone, and I knew it was in one of those 20 to 25 bags of leaves, because it had come off during the, the project. So the only thing I knew to do was to go out into the country, and it was a windy day, and to lift up the bags, let the leaves blow away, and let the, the ring drop. And so that was my plan, and I got to about the second bag, and a policeman pulls up and asks me, what are you doing? And I said, well, here's that. I told him the whole story. And you know what he did? He stood there, and he got his pencil, pen, and paper out, and he wrote me a ticket. Can you believe it? And he said I was littering. And so off to court I go, weeks later I go to court, and I still remember this experience, that I'm standing before the judge, and I had different options of what I could do. And I could do A, B, or C, and I could pay the fine and do this, but if I, you know, if I lose the case, then it's going to be really expensive, and you know, all of these things are going on my hand, so I just had to plead guilty, and had to pay my fine and walk away. And it was that experience of a courtroom that I will never forget because some of you maybe feel like that is what church is like. Like I'm standing before other people and I just feel judged. I don't feel like I'm in a brother-sisterly relationship and it just feels like I'm restricted. I feel critiqued. I don't feel loved. That's not what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place of love. Now, granted... The scripture is very clear about, yes, we are to make moral evaluations about situations that relate to other people. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 24, that we can judge correctly. So we got to get this thing figured out. What does it mean for us to judge correctly? Well, it means that we at times need to confront others, and when we do so, we do so according to the Scripture. Matthew chapter 18, we do it directly. We go to that person, and we say, hey, I've got an issue here. We need to talk about this. So we confront directly. We also, in verse 10 in this passage in James that we just read, verse 10 that sets up the passage that we read today, it talks about be humble. Humble yourself before the Lord. So this whole context of slander and judgment is because we haven't humbled ourselves. And so when we go to somebody else and we judge in the sense of we need to have a conversation and we need to confront, we're making a moral evaluation, I go directly and I go humbly. And then we also learn in the scripture that when I go to somebody, I go gently. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, restore the brother gently. And then it also says you should go carefully. Because watch out, lest you too be tempted. So there are at least four ways that we can approach and we can judge correctly, directly, humbly, carefully, gently, but always for the purpose of restoration. Never for the sense of being critical or judgmental in that sense. This is how family works. Today, when you go home, there's probably not, well, there won't be a single person who goes home and seeks to destroy your home. You're going to go home and take care of your home. You will not go home and pick up a hammer and start beating at the wall. You will not go home and, you know, eat lunch and throw, your, throw the, the, the leftovers on the floor. You will not throw your trash on the floor. You will not do anything to your home, you know, that, that would harm your home. In fact, most of you will do just the opposite. Sometimes in our home, it's like 20 minutes of torture. And so we say, for the next 20 minutes, it's cleanup time. We call it 20 minutes of torture. And so for 20 minutes, it's like dishes go in the dishwasher, and beds get made, and we pick up clothes, and laundry gets going, and and we just all rally together for 20 minutes because we want to take care of our home. And yet, isn't it interesting in the spiritual house that we are in, how oftentimes we hurt and damage one another? 
And we say things about one another and we slander towards one another. We judge one another and we're killing each other. We're, hurt. we're tearing down our own house as a family. Now, there are major differences as I began to think about what are the differences between brothers and sisters and judges? And a few came to mind. Brothers and sisters stand on equal ground. Judges sit above you. They're elevated. Brothers and sisters are looking for the best in each other, or at least they should be as brothers and sisters. Judges, by nature of their job, are looking for the faults. That's what they do. Brothers and sisters forgive each other. Judges punish. It's more punitive than it is redemptive. And so Paul says the same as James says when Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Look at this scripture. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Are you, why do you despise? And that word despise in the NIV is translated, why do you look down on? Why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So here we are. We're brothers and sisters. Let's care for one another. Let's build up the house. Let's not be critical and judge. Here's the second thing that I think we can learn from this passage. We're first of all brothers and sisters, not judges. But secondly, to slander is to judge. To slander is to judge. Look at verse 11 again just quickly. Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother and judges them speaks against the law. So in other words, to slander is to speak against somebody else, which puts you in a self-appointed role of authority to judge another person. So slandering is speaking against a brother and It's judging that person. And it talks about here in this uh, passage that slanderous judgment can go in a couple of different directions. And so let's just talk about the first one. First of all, it goes towards another person, obviously. Slander goes towards another person. How so? By speaking critically about somebody and belittling them, making them appear as small in the eyes of others. Let me just say that again. It's speaking about somebody by belittling them, making them appear as small in the eyes of another person. And it's usually done behind their back. It's literally a word that means to speak down. It's speaking from a higher place. That's slander. Alistair Begg says it this way. It's the harmful repeating of stories about the wrongs and offenses of others. It's the harmful repeating of stories about the wrongs and offenses of others. Does that relate to any of us today? Questions that we can ask ourselves when I get into this mode of wanting to say something Here are some questions to consider. Am I talking to the right person when I share this story about another? Or should I be going directly to the person that I'm speaking about? Or is what I'm saying hurting someone's reputation by putting them in a negative light? That's slander. Or how about this? What is my real motive in sharing this? Why am I even saying this? Because isn't it interesting that whenever I'm speaking down about another person, it's sort of making me feel a little bit better about myself. And it might even be true information. Slander doesn't necessarily have to be false information. It can be just be the way you're presenting it is a misrepresentation or it's speaking about somebody instead of to them. And then if you're on the listening side as well, it may not just be you're participating in slander by being the speaker, but maybe you're on the listening side. And a challenge might be that you might want to consider that if somebody is willing to speak this way about somebody else to you, it's probably just a matter of time until they speak this way about you as well. Have you ever been slandered against? It's a painful, 
thing. To catch word or to get word that something has come about you, but not to you. And I don't want to make this heavier or bigger than it needs to be, but I mean, this happened just recently to me. And and fortunately, somebody who was on the receiving end wanted clarification of this. And so they, they, they came... Uh, and, and spoke in such a way that, hey, I need to get understanding and clarity. And, and then word was able to, through this other person, was able to say, no, this is not the, that's not the story, and you need to go back to that person, and you need to give clarity with that person. And that person did. And the response of the individual was so cool because this person said they felt conviction, and they were so glad that they got the story right. Slander. Some of you have had that. You've experienced that. You know what it is to be spoken against. It's painful and it's very dangerous. Jerry Bridges wrote a book called Respectable Sins. And so he talks about things that we tend to just sort of wink at in in the church today. Pride, anger, discontentment. And one of those chapters deals with judgmentalism. Sins we tolerate. And one of those sins was the sin of slander. And it's a very serious sin. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm sorry that we're so heavy this morning, but it just is what it is. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, it talks about equating the sin of slander. Are you ready for this? There are several sins listed in the same verse. And it talks about slander in the same verse as it talks about sexual immorality. And we tend to think, uh, oh my goodness, sexual immorality, that's a big deal. And it is, and it should be addressed. But then we just are like, with slander, mm, kind of wink at that. Not as big a deal. It's, it's a serious thing in God's eyes. Jerry Bridges writes in his book, Respectable Sins. I just want to read a portion of it. He, closely, he says, closely related to the sin of gossip is the sin of slander. It's making a false statement or a misrepresentation about another person that defames or damages the person's reputation. We slander when we ascribe wrong motives to people, even though we can't see their hearts or know their particular circumstances. We slander when we say another believer is not, quote, committed when he or she doesn't practice the same spiritual disciplines we do. We slander when we misrepresent another person's position on a subject without first determining what their position, that person's position is. We slander when we blow out of proportion another person's sin and make that person appear to be more sinful than he or she really is. The motive behind slander is often to gain an advantage in some way over another person. And he talks about how this happens in the business world with backbiting or climbing the corporate ladder over people's backs. And he closes by saying slander is actually lying. The sin of slander. So slanderous judgment goes against another person. Verse 11, when you speak against, that's slander. Slander is speaking against, down to another person. And it says, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother, in the translation that we read earlier, it would be or judges them. In the King James Version, it says, when you slander and speak against them and judge them. And they're really linked together because when you slander, you are judging. And so you're you're slandering and judging against another person. And secondly, you're judging what it says in the Scripture here against the law. Now, what does that mean? Well, in James chapter 2, verse 8, he talks about the royal law. And so when we judge, we're basically disregarding the royal law. We're speaking against somebody else and we're sitting in judgment of the law saying, I don't care what the law says. And what does the law say? The royal law says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So think about how how do you treat yourself? I mean, we tend to forgive ourselves. We tend to... to speak highly of ourselves or to think highly of ourselves. We tend to excuse ourselves. Do we treat others the same way? Or are we disregarding and speaking against the royal law? 
So secondly, to slander is to judge. Thirdly, there's only one judge who judges perfectly. Only one judges perfectly in verse 12. It says, who are you to judge? Who are you to judge? The inference being there's really only one judge who understands the entire picture. In fact, in, uh, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Judge nothing before the appointed time, because then God will bring to light even the motives of men. That is the judge who knows everything that's going on inside of another person. How we typically judge, we tend to judge superficially. We usually don't have all the facts, or we don't know somebody's background. We don't understand their heart. There's a story of this in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. The, you remember the story. David is off to see his brothers. They're fighting the Philistines. You've got the Goliath on one side representing the Philistines, and you've got the Israelites uh, on the other side. David runs into the battle, and he says, hey, what's going on? And the older brother, Eliab, says, why are you here? And here's what he says. You have a conceited heart. You have a wicked heart, and he judges his motives. He knows nothing about David's heart, and yet he places judgment on his heart because he's judging superficially. We tend to judge self-righteously. Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 7 that we often try to remove the speck in somebody else's eye, like I can see so clearly what's wrong with you, and yet he says there's a plank in your own eye. We tend to judge self-righteously. We don't sin, see the sin of others. We don't see our own sin as clearly as we see the sin of others. And then we tend to, to judge forgetfully. Ephesians 4.32 says, Forgive each other as Christ has forgiven you. And if we could only think about, oh my goodness, look at what God has forgiven me of. And look at the grace that I have received. Then it makes a difference on how we view other people and how we would judge them as well. Only one judges perfectly. And then finally, as we close, we think about the good news of grace. You remember the story in John chapter 8? this adulterous woman, she's caught in adultery. And, and she's brought before Jesus. And the law required a death penalty. And Jesus says, whoever is without sin can cast the first stone. And from the oldest to the youngest, these people walked away. Have you ever thought about and considered that Jesus had no sin? And therefore had every right to, uh, to throw the stone. And yet he didn't. He didn't throw the stone. And the reason that he didn't throw is because he didn't come to judge the world, but he came to save the world. John chapter 3 verse 17 is that God didn't send his son to judge the world, but to save it. And what if that could be our mentality? That we are not here to judge the world, we're not here to judge one another, but we're here to save it, to redeem it, to restore it. And how did Jesus do that? He saves it by taking the judgment, by receiving the stones thrown upon himself, by going to the cross himself, by taking the sin of all mankind which deserves judgment and taking that upon himself the Savior of the world, instead of the judge who came to condemn. Well, this is our job as a church, as brothers and sisters. And so I wonder if we could somehow flip this and say, do not slander, do not speak against your brothers and sisters by slandering them. What if we flip this and said, encourage. And when you're with other people, speak highly of this other person. And if you don't have anything great to say about that person, then don't speak. 
What would that be like in a fellowship? What would be, that be like in a, in a church family where we live that way and we're speaking highly of others instead of speaking down about them? We're going to take communion this morning, and as we do, I want us to think about a couple of things. One is the vertical relationship that we have with God. The fact that we have this, this, this relationship that He has, has made a way for us to be able to experience grace, His death on the cross. And so when I take the, the, the bread and I take the cup, I'm, I'm receiving again the grace that God has given me by His substitution, taking the penalty of my own sin. But I also want us to think today about the horizontal relationships that God gives us. Because it may be during this time of communion that you need to go to an individual and you need to say, would you forgive me? I've spoken wrongly or I've hurt you in some way. And this would be an opportunity before you receive communion to say, I need to get that, that right with you. It may be just something in your own heart that you need to say, I know I need to let this go. And I need to release this. It's been covered, and it's God's business, and he's the judge, and I will let that go. So let's take communion together. The tables will be in the back of the room. They're actually, uh, I know many of you are gluten-free, and so there's a gluten-free option here by the wall. Um, but uh, let's pray together. Receive the bread and the cup. Come back to your seats. You can take communion on your own when you're ready, but let's pray together, together and give thanks for grace. God, we thank you for the, the incredible grace that you show to us. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for forgiveness. God, we thank you that you are a, a God who sent a Savior instead of a judge. Lord, I pray that as we reflect and think about this gift of grace, that we would be thankful and mindful of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. And secondly, I pray that, God, we would be mindful of the importance of relationships around us. To build one another up, to encourage, to bless, and to love. We thank you for the body of Christ, for the family of Christ. We thank you that this is a, a family room this morning and not a courtroom. God, help us to be a people who bless and love and give grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.